25th was Madeline Soto's 13th birthday party, a big day in any child's life, celebrating the end of one phase and the start of the next, the teenaged years. But tragically for Madeline, this was not the beginning of her teenaged years. It was the end of her life. She was reported missing the next day by her mother, Jen, and investigators believe she was already dead by 819 that morning. But that doesn't match the story given by the main suspect, Stefan Stearns, Jen's live-in boyfriend. He says he dropped Madeline off at school, a story Jen repeated to police and to the public in television interviews. Tonight, we will take you to Madeline's neighborhood and retrace the alleged steps and route taken by Stefan Stearns on the morning of February 26th. Does this story make sense? And does it match some of the known evidence in the case? What was captured on surveillance cameras? Where was the car located? Does the timeline fit? We'll bring in our experts looking for answers as we continue to investigate the tragic life and death of Madeline Soto. I'm Benny Politan. Thank you for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments as we continue our in-depth coverage of the disappearance and then murder of Madeline Soto. She is an innocent victim in all of this. She did nothing wrong. According to investigators, she began to be sexually abused and victimized at the age of eight years old. And that abuse continued year after year until she was dead, just after her 13th birthday. Someone tried to steal that innocence from her, but she is an innocent victim in all of this. Always have to keep that in mind. Now, let's talk about uh, Stephen Stearns. He told a story. He didn't exercise his right to remain silent when Madeline was reported missing. She was already dead, but she was reported missing. He spoke out. He spoke publicly, and he told a story. And, and that story is important. It's important uh, for investigators. It's important for prosecutors. It's obviously important for him. And perhaps if he gets charged with murder, it'll be important for the jury to understand what his story was of what happened that day. And we're going to examine that story. We're going we're to trace step for step what he said happened that morning. Now, here's the other part of the equation. Madeline's mom, Jen, mom told the same story. Why is she telling the same story? What motivated that? Did she have independent knowledge? Was she just relying on and trusting the man who had been in her life for about six years? Was she pressured? Was she intimidated? Was she oblivious to the truth? Did she have something to do with it? Did she lie? There are a lot of questions about Jen Soto and what is behind what she was saying. Not just publicly on television, but also to investigators. Because some of this stuff, I don't think it makes sense. It doesn't fit with the independent, trustworthy, like video evidence in the case. It just, it, it's, it's not making common sense and it doesn't seem to match the evidence. But we don't know what's motivating what she's saying, but she told the same story that Stefan said. It's the same story about what happened that morning and what happened the day before. No real variation from it. As a matter of fact, at one point, she's kind of including herself in, in taking Madeline to school. Later saying it was my partner, Stefan. But still, she adopted that story. And that's what everyone was hearing when, when she first went missing. Now, um, the question tonight is, does it all make sense? And, and will it fit with the evidence? I, I, I don't know. That, we're going to bring in our experts to take a look at that, and we're going to uh, trace all of these steps. But first, let's take a step back and, and take a listen one more time 
WFTV on top of the story down in Orlando spoke with Jen Soto and Stephen Stearns. Let's remind you of what they said, what their story is. We dropped her off at school, close to school. Um, she wanted to walk the rest of the way. She was uh, spotted walking uh, by the church, by the middle school uh, on the cameras. They saw her hang out in the parking lot for a little bit and then get up and leave. They didn't see a vehicle or anything else. They just saw her walk away uh, around 9 a.m. heading towards the school, but she never made it. I dropped her off. Everything looked fine when I drove away. It's the last time we saw her. What were the conversations that y'all had in the car when you dropped her off? Not well, much. She was asleep for most of the way. Told her have a good day at school when she got out. I love her. She said, thanks. Love you, too. What was it? The church across the street had some cameras, and they mentioned seeing her waiting around in the parking lot for a while before moving on, and that was it. But it was greedy. It was greedy footage and not much, not much else. Grainy footage. That's interesting, right? Okay, so let's take a look at the, the map so we kind of understand the context of, of what this story is and what he says happened that day. And we begin at Madeline Soto's home. Um, this is in the Venetian Bays subdivision, Santa Maria Drive. Uh, from there, um, it's about 5.6 miles or so until um, the United Methodist Church, Peace United Methodist Church. And you take that drive, you know, depending upon traffic, probably about 20 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. You know, it depends upon how many stoplights you hit, etc. cetera. Um, then the last piece of that is the 0.4, four-tenths of a mile walk from the church area to Hunter's Creek Middle School. That's the walk right there. So this is what we're talking about. So let's bring in Court TV producer Cody Thomas, just back from Florida, uh, joins us here in studio tonight. Cody, great to see you. Welcome back. Um, so you retraced th this trip. I did. We followed that story from start to finish, from Venetian Bay to Peace United Methodist Church to Hunter's Creek Middle School. Not that short of a trip, but what stood out to me the most was how close the church and the school really were. Of course, we know it's 0.4 miles, but when I really visualized it, you could see the school from the church. And of course, we'll get into that distance here in a minute, but I want to walk you through that entire journey we took from Venetian Bay to the school. Now that is the front gate to those Venetian Bay Village's apartments where Madeline Soto and her family lived. It's where her day began on February 26th, of course, the day she went missing. It's also where suspect Stephen Stern says he picked her up before taking her to school. Now, as we can see, that is a heavily secured gate. There's a security guard in the little hut right there checking every single car that comes in, and there's plenty of cameras catching every single car that goes in and out. But there is also a back gate to the complex where Stearns could have exited the complex to take her to school that morning. So we're going to go check that out right now. Now, this is the back gate to the Venetian Bay apartment complex where Madeline Soto and her family lived. You can see a car pulling in now. It is also the gate closest to that dumpster that's referenced a lot in the police reports. We know now that that dumpster is where police recovered Madeline Soto's book bag and her school issued laptop. They say they have Stephen Stearns on camera throwing those items away in that dumpster the morning that Madeline went missing around 7.45 a.m. And I actually went and took some video of that dumpster earlier, and you can see that there are cameras right around where the dumpster is. So there's almost little to no doubt that those are the cameras that picked him up that police are referencing. And also, if you look closer to this back gate, you can see cameras looking right at every car that comes through those gates. And we do also know that police say they have video of Stearns returning to the complex with Madeline's body in the car the morning that she went missing when she was supposed to be at school. And of course, that is where police say they believe Madeline was already dead in the back of that car. But we are going to follow more of Stern's story. So now we're going to take that drive from here, the Venetian Bay apartment complex, 
over to Peace United Methodist Church where he says he dropped her off that morning before school. Now, something I am noticing on this drive to the church, we're going through plenty of busy intersections, all of which are flooded with security cameras. And my immediate thought is, if police don't already have it, they could probably track his entire route from the apartment complex to the church and even from the church back to the apartment complex. Just something to think about as I'm going down this road from the Venetian Bay Apartments to Peace United Methodist Church. Now we are arriving at Peace United Methodist Church here on my left. Again, we are following the story that Stearns says happened the morning of February 26th when Madeline Soto went missing. He says he picked her up and took her from the Venetian Bay Apartments here to the Peace United Methodist Church to drop her off before school. We are here now at that Peace United Methodist Church where Stephen Stern says he dropped Madeline Soto off that morning of February 26th when she went missing. Now, take a look down this road, Town Loop Boulevard. You know, we got some cars here. It's very wide open. You can see almost anything going on in this church parking lot in this green space in front of the church. And we were actually out here earlier this morning around that time, 8.30 a.m., that Stephen Stern says he did drop Madeline off. Now, one more thing to note down this road. There's security cameras on top of almost every single light post. Now, police authorities say they have evidence of Madeline Soto in this parking lot at some point that day. We took a wrap around the parking lot. We didn't really see any cameras in the church parking lot itself, but that's not to say there couldn't be a camera inside that points out the glass front doors that could have picked her up as well. But the most important thing to note about this location, just down this way, under this overpass, that's Hunter's Creek Middle School. That's the school where Madeline Soto attends, where she was supposed to be walking that morning. So we're going to take that walk right now and see how long it takes. Right now it's about 12, 18-ish. So let's see what that walk may have looked like for Madeline Soto that morning. Now, as we walk down this road, we can see that it is pretty wide open, you know, for a 13-year-old girl to be walking by herself this length from this church to this school. And we also see a dump truck back here. There was construction going on just a little bit earlier. That means she might have had to stray off into the road to get around it. That could be pretty dangerous, pretty frightening for a young 13-year-old girl to be doing this by herself. Now again, as we're here walking, cars are steadily coming by. And when we were out here earlier this morning, during that morning rush, there were way more cars coming by. Lots of visibility, ample amounts of visibility from the road. Right now it's about lunchtime, so there's a little less. But again, around 8.30 this morning, way more cars than we're seeing right now. So it is a very busy road here on Town Loop Boulevard as we make our way from Peace United Methodist Church down to Madeline School, Hunter's Creek Middle School. Now this here is the site of that construction we did see earlier. The construction workers may be on a lunch break right now, but earlier they were coming across the sidewalk. So the entire sidewalk was blocked off. And again, who's to say that wasn't going on that morning? Whatever they are here doing, whatever they're trying to improve, Madeline may have had to stray off right here into the main busy road, which again, very dangerous for a young girl, very dangerous for anybody, but especially a young 13 year old girl out here by herself walking to school that morning. Now we are here under this overpass on this walk from the church to the school. This is Highway 417 here in Orlando. Very busy road. Now again, we know she was supposed to be out here in the daytime, the early morning hours of February 26th. But even in the day, it gets a little dark under here. 
you know, you can still see, but it gets a little dark. It could be a little spooky, a little scary. Again, for a 13 year old young girl walking out here by herself. We did just clear under that underpass. Again, that was Highway 417 here in Orlando, approaching Hunter's Creek Middle School, the middle school where Madeline Soto attended. Of course, we now know that she never made it to school that day on February 26th. Her mother showed up around 4.30 p.m. just to be informed that Madeline Soto did not make it. Now, I'm looking down at my watch. That walk took between six and seven minutes, which is, to me, a long way for a 13-year-old girl, 13 girl to be walking by herself that morning. And again, we do know that Madeline Soto never made it to school on that fateful day. I have one big question here, and this, is, this has been bothering me, right? Mm -hmm. The, the drop-off, like, the story is drop-off because she's embarrassed that, you know, growing up is dropping her off, she's a teenager, blah, 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 right? I've seen it in teen movies. I've never seen it in real life, but you could... If, if you're at that church, you could stay there and you could probably, could you see her, like make it to school safely? Without a doubt. You can see the Hunt, Hunter's Creek Middle School parking lot from the church, through the overpass, you could see everything. You could watch her walk that entire length to know she's safe and then leave if that was what you wanted to do. But what didn't make sense to me was how close the church was. Like, I don't understand why he would have to drop her at the church versus Doing that, of course, the teen, the teen angle. They say, but. oh, yeah, she's going to blame it on the victim, of course. Blame right. it on the victim. Blame it on Madeline. Um, but at the end of the day, like, if you're a responsible parent or, like, a normal parent, like, in today's world, because there's, like, you know, pedophiles out there, um, you would, if your 13-year-old daughter or stepdaughter or girlfriend's daughter, whoever it is right. you're responsible for, okay, I'll just watch you to make sure you get there. Right. It and he could just stay there and could watch and see if she's okay. It's, that's exactly right. Quite literally does not make any sense that he would drop her off there and leave And then her. turn around, I'm out of here. I dropped yeah. her. No, A middle it makes no sense. Doesn't make any sense. Now, you, the one thing that I saw, um, the, the construction that was going on, I guess the question is, was it going on at that, that day? Because right. if it was, if it was, you know we'll hear about it, right. perhaps from the defense. Uh, yeah. Any idea whether it was going on on the 26th of February, we just don't know. I don't want to say we don't know, but it did look like they were still in progress. Whatever they were working on did not look like it was anywhere close to being finished. It looked like it had been going on for at least a few days, if not a few weeks. Okay, right. so I think that's an important part of it. Um, one other thing I noted here, those, those traffic cams on the lights. Almost every single street light had one of those traffic cams. I may have seen maybe two or three that didn't have one. It was one of the most heavily camera surveilled, surveilled roads I've seen. And as I said in that piece just now, there was no cameras in the actual church lot. So my assumption would be that it had to be one of those traffic cams that picked her up in that parking lot at some point that morning. Yeah, and she's walking around and, and what they see, if she was there, right? If she was like, even there. Maybe someone was there, it was so grainy, they, maybe they thought it was her. Maybe somebody was pretending to be her. Um, one more thing to note about yeah. that lot. We were out there in the morning no kids were getting dropped off there. There were barely any cars there to begin with in the first place. There were maybe three or four cars at around 8, 30, 9 o'clock in the morning. Okay. So doesn't seem like it was a common place for that to happen. All right. Wow. All right, Cody, great work. Um, obviously, this story's not over because tomorrow's a big day. Right? A, a, an update from the Kissimmee Police Department. Let's put this up on the screen because right. this, is, this is pretty significant. Um, Two o'clock tomorrow, the Kissimmee Police Department will highlight the progress of the investigation of the Madeline Soto case. Since her reported disappearance on February 26, 24, the department has been diligently pursuing leads, gathering information and evidence to piece together the timeline leading up to her death. So tomorrow, 2 o'clock, and Court TV, of course, will be uh, covering that live for you folks. We'll get an update from Kissimmee PD. Cody Thomas, uh, thank you so much. When we come back, folks, we're going to bring in some experts.
um, to analyze this, piece together some of the evidence. Shannon Butler from WFTV uh, will join us as well. Plus, coming up next hour. <laughs> In Norfolk County, Massachusetts, a case like any other in the history of court TV. Former professor Karen Reed went out drinking with her police officer boyfriend, John O'Keefe. Prosecutors say Karen Reed purposely struck him with her car and left him to die when dropping him off at a friend's house. But Karen Reed says she was framed and she was set up by police. Today, Karen Reed was back in court. Drug ring, a double murder, and deadly secrets in a small town. Prosecutors allege Timothy Vero killed two women because he believed they were working as police informants. The Small Town Secrets Murder Trial, weekday mornings on Court TV. There's no way, Morgan, I can ever come up with this. We're moving closer to the trial in the case against Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty. It's the doomsday prophet, Chad Daybell, on trial. Our detectives have determined that Madeline was never dropped off on the morning of February 26th near her school. Instead, we believe she was already dead at the time and that Stephen Stearns moved her body in the early morning hours on that day. So police have their theory, but Stephen Stearns has his story. So does his story match up with uh, the police timeline? Let's take a look. Let's remind you what Stephen's story is. February 26th, picks up Madeline at home, dropped Madeline off at the Peace United Methodist Preschool at around 840, and then Madeline walked the rest of the way to Hunter's Creek Middle School. That's his story. Here's, according to police, sort of the timeline and map of things that happened that day. 7.35 a.m., Stephen Stearns is discarding Madeline's backpack and school laptop in the dumpster at the Venetian Bay Villages complex where they live. At 8.10, a license plate reader catches Stearns' plates driving away from Hunter's Creek Middle School. That's at 8.10. 8.19. Stearns is returning to Venetian Bay apartment complex and Madeline can be seen in the vehicle and police believe she's deceased at the time, 819. And then 1 to 2.30, uh, Stephen Stearns is in the St. Cloud area, that's like 20 plus miles away, uh, changing a flat tire. Let's bring in our guest. Does any of this make sense? Does his story make sense? Joining us in uh, Orlando, Florida, WFTV investigative reporter Shannon Butler. In Michigan City, Indiana, private investigator and founder of Victims News Online, Erica Morse. And joining us from Salt Lake City, Utah, private investigator Jason Jensen. Great to see and have everyone here tonight. I understand, Shannon, there's a slight delay here, so I'm just warning the folks at home that um, a slight delay in our connection. So, Shannon, let me begin with you. Um, in, in, in comparing Stephen Stern's story with what police are saying, it, it, to me, there, it's, it's not adding up. There's conflict here. Well, there's a lot of conflict. First, he lives in the home, so I'm not sure why he was picking her up to take her to school. Um, at 7.35, those investigators believe that Madeline Soto was already deceased. The only reason they don't know that for sure is because they had a hard time with the camera angle in, in that vehicle, but they believe that she was in that vehicle at the time. Then there is a license plate reader just after eight o'clock, showing Stephen Stern's car over by the school, leaving that area. Then we know at 819, he was back at the apartment complex and that's when they could tell that Madeline Soto was dead in the front seat of that car. So dropping her off at that church, because remember we've heard two stories, that they dropped her off at school, then we heard that he dropped her off near the school. And now we look at that time when the school started at 930 and he says he dropped her off about 840. Why are you dropping a 13 year old girl off near a school an hour before? 
our school charts. The gates aren't even open. The doors aren't even open. What, what would you be dropping her off? And if you remember, he said that he watched her dig through her backpack in the church parking lot looking for, he thought, maybe her headphones because she was always doing that. And then he watched her walk away. None of that uh, video evidence shows that none of that is true. Digging through the backpack. Oh, all right. Erica Morse. So let's let's what what do you think this means? What do you think's going on here? Because the license plate reader has him near the school at 810. Is he trying to set up a story or is something happening in the car? That, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand what this could possibly mean if he's near the school at 810 and then comes back. Um, and, and she's apparently not alive inside the car at 819. Betty, I went back and forth over this timeline a dozen times because of that specific window. There are details in there that don't yet make sense to us based on what we know. It's just that simple. That 735 dumping of the laptop in the backpack, first of all, I raise a 13-year-old child and there is no way he got that backpack with that school issue laptop out of the hands of a living 13-year-old girl. That didn't happen. So my issue at this point is with the 735 to 819. I am unclear if he left to us to, to dump the backpack, to scout a location, to establish a potential presence near the school, because I'm also unclear where she was killed yet. And we don't know, and I think that's why we don't have any murder charges at this point, I think they're trying to determine if this was a murder in the commission of a kidnapping or if she was killed at home and then moved. That will make the difference between a capital case or not. So Jason Jensen, if you're let's let's work under the police theory here that they believe that she's dead at 735. This guy's driving around town with a dead child in the car. He's driving around. So do you what could be going through his mind is it almost looks like he's trying to set up and figure out what his story is going to be. Um, but as Shannon pointed out, he's like way ahead of the game here because school starts at nine at nine thirty. But if you're real close to the time the school starts, there's going to be lots of other kids and people there, aka witnesses. So what is what is what do you think he's attempting to do if you believe the police theory here? Well, I believe that everyone here is correct, that it's essential to understand that him disposing of the laptop and the backpack at 735 is, is essential because she's already deceased. The question is, at that point, you know, why drive around? You know, that's what you just asked. So I believe what this indicates is he's got to remove a melon from the home just in case Jen shows up, but he's... You know, he certainly is panicking, trying to figure out where to dispose of this 13-year-old so that he can go around and uh, fabricate the rest of his morning in hopes to deflect responsibility for this because clearly, you know, it doesn't look good for him. No. I mean, it, it looks... I'm not, Nothing is, like, 100% sure or 100% obvious, but, you know... First, you got to eliminate the people closest to her, right? Like the last person with her. And you can't eliminate him. There's no way you can eliminate him from this. Uh, but Shannon, let me, let, me add, let me add one more thing to our timeline, which is significant. And we add Jen Soto. She's apparently home at 8 o'clock and is saying that she sees her daughter getting dressed at 8 a.m. Like, you throw that into the mix here, um, all of a sudden it gets much more complicated involving mom well i guess it depends on which story of hers you want to look at because what she told us in the interview that she only spoke to her the night before after her birthday party she never told us that she saw uh, her daughter leave for school we found that in the original report that those responding deputies took when she said that her daughter was missing after she went to pick her up at school. 
that's what she told those responding deputies that she saw her daughter uh, get dressed uh, for school. And that was after eight o'clock. That seems strange because at 735, Stefan Stearns was already dumping that stuff in the dumpster. I think that they were, at least he was trying to, because he told us that Madeline was asleep in the car all the way to school because we asked, what did she say? What was your last conversation? Was anything odd, you know, anything out of the ordinary for, you know, a 13 year old besides, you know, just being 13. And he said, she slept the whole way. So if that story, if he wanted to go with that story, people in that complex would have seen him in and out of that complex and she was in the front seat and it would look possibly to somebody who didn't know anything was going on that she was in fact asleep on the way to school uh, the story a little bit started to unravel then at 8 19 where they could tell that madeline soto was not asleep and then remember he leaves that apartment complex and more video will show him on the way to the place where Mad body was found and it will show that he was also in contact with her body there in a much different state now erica morse something else i just realized now if he is saying that she's asleep all the way are you gonna oh wake up we're here at the church go walk like that makes no sense that makes no sense absolutely not if you've ever tried to wake a child that fell asleep in the car Car, it doesn't work that way. Um, so, no, I, you know, I, I think exactly what everybody's saying is spot on. I think that he didn't expect those cameras to catch him um, dumping that that stuff in the dumpster. I don't think he expected to be caught necessarily on camera. And you know what? He also made a special trip back just to get that clicker so he could move in and out using that back gate where it isn't guarded. And one of the main questions I have is, if is that security shack, that guard shack, is that manned 24-7? Or is that maybe only 7A to 7E? Um, do we know that there was somebody physically inside that shack at 7, maybe 7.35 in the morning or 7.30 when he left? We don't have that information yet either. And then, thank God, I mean, I know we'll probably get to it. But I do believe divine intervention probably intervened. And this man ended up with a flat tire, you know, 30 feet across from an open gate where the where the dump site was. And thank God we had a witness that saw him. Yes. Now, um, Cody Thomas was down there. And while he was down there, there was someone in that mm -hmm. guarding the front gate the, the whole time that he was there. Okay. By the way, if you didn't know that there's a camera at the dumpster, if you take a look at that video, like the camera is right there. It's like... I've never seen anything like it near a dumpster anywhere, anywhere else in the world. Like, here's a dumpster, and there's a big pole, and there's a camera pointed right at the dumpster. So I don't know what he was thinking there. I, none of this makes sense. We don't catch the smart ones. Um, he's charged with 60 things right now, but as of this point, he's not charged with the murder. No one's been charged with the murder. Uh, the mother has not been named a suspect, but we've got more to talk about. When we come back, all our guests stay with us, and we're going to talk about some jailhouse calls by Stephen Stearns. Welcome back. So one big um, piece of information that you want to give to the public and to police when your child go miss, goes missing is, well, what were they wearing? What were they wearing? Well, Jen Soto spoke to police, spoke to WFTV, and talked about what Madeline was wearing on the 26th. Let's take a listen. She was last seen wearing a green hoodie, black shorts, white Crocs, a black Jan Sport backpack with gray hibiscus flowers on it. All right, I don't know about that backpack. I don't know where that's coming from. Um, but anyway, uh, Shannon Butler, let me ask you, investigative reporter, WFTV, uh, do we know what Jen Soto was wearing when she was found on Hickory Tree Road in that tree line in the brush after she had been murdered? Well, 
Uh, we do, uh, because Sheriff County um, accidentally posted a picture of her body uh, on social media. Uh, and in that picture, she is wearing a green hoodie. Um, we cannot see the shoes, uh, but she is wearing what appears to be blue jeans or denim shorts, um, not black. Um, we don't know what that backpack looked like, which doesn't maybe matter because it wasn't with the child. It was in the dumpster, um, but we don't know what shoes. So it was um, odd to me uh, that she didn't get quite right what her daughter was wearing when she left because remember she told us or uh, she told police that she did see her daughter leave for school all right jason jensen what are your thoughts about mom giving this description that kind of puts her in the middle of everything in that morning but then when you match it up with the timeline um i think it creates a little bit of a problem for her it really will, Benny. And one of the problems that you have is whenever a child goes missing, you know, you get everybody concerned, especially within the core family, and they will take what they know as and with the things that they hear and incorporate that as one, you know, one size fits all kind of answer for everybody. And if they're given misinformation, then they disseminate that misinformation. So I believe that's what is going on here is Jen relied on what Stefan told her and that's being shared with you know law enforcement or the public which doesn't help if this was a real missing person situation because you want to get accurate information out there but we know that there's a cover-up going on and Stefan is behind it now jailhouse calls we go back, you know, more than 10 years. There was a woman from Central Florida got arrested, made some calls uh, to her parents, et cetera. Became a big part of the story of the case. Stephen Stearns uh, apparently uh, making some calls. Let's take a look. March 1st, 2024, 1035, calling a 210 area code, which is a San Antonio area code. Talk time, zero seconds. March 3rd. Uh, 515 407 area code of course that's o-town orlando talk time zero seconds and that number seems to come back to his name when you look it up shannon butler i know you're tracking down all these records um have you uncovered anything are there videos of these calls does anything like that exist um so i i guess i thought it was a little bit odd that there was no phone call since those because we've asked you know kind of every few days to see if anyone was called that has not changed see he hasn't had a phone call in quite some time that last phone call uh with his dad um and since then no family members have have spoken to him we don't know um what those video if it's video if it was just a phone call we don't have that yet it used to be where we could get those phone calls and you could hear what was said. They've put some uh, rules on that now and we're not able to hear uh, what was said or what they could, what we could see um, from video. Um, and I think of that case that you're talking about, I think that uh, suspects and their families um, have learned a lot about what to say and what not to say on those jailhouse calls. But really since then, you don't see any calls back and forth with Jen Soto. You don't see any calls uh, back and forth with his family. We know he doesn't have a, you know, uh, a high priced attorney right now. He's got a public defender. He says he can't afford attorney. Uh, I, I imagine that the attorneys are visiting him in jail, but for right now, he seems pretty isolated um, from the public now, not being able to or making any phone calls or getting any phone calls in jail. Eric Morris, you look at the profile of this guy. If he is, in fact, a predator, everything he did seemingly in his life was to gain access. And the ultimate access to gain is a single mom with a young girl. And uh, when he met Jen Soto, Madeline was about seven years old. This is classic behavior if it turns out to be true. If it turns out to be true, we have 60 counts so far, Vinny. 
Um, listen, I got my start in investigations when a 13 year old was kidnapped by mom's boyfriend. And then we found thousands of images of bestiality and child pornography. And he was never charged for that. But this case has so many correlations to Haley Dunn, it makes me sick. And as somebody who has thoroughly investigated that case, everything from mom's story that does not jive that morning, his continuous stories, him moving around all over the place, these 60 counts, 20 of which are instances, independent instances of sexual assault. And you can tell the progression, Vinny, because half the charges are from when she was under the age of 12, and a lot of the charges are then when she was over the age of 12. I want to know, was there an, ever an outcry in a school setting? Did mom ever get any wind of this? Did we ever have a CPS case opened or investigated? Were there ever any allegations of inappropriate touching her behavior. There are a million questions that yet need to be answered from my perspective. Shannon Butler, any information like that um, coming out from your investigation of this case? Um, there's still quite a bit of question or quite a few questions about uh, Jen Soto. Uh, they're pretty tight lipped. Uh, we know that they are looking into her. Uh, the story didn't help uh, that the stories were different, not only to us, but then to other media outlets and then to law enforcement. Um, I know that there are some thoughts about the reaction when she found out the news uh, about her daughter, about uh, her boyfriend, uh, likely never seeing uh, the light of day again if these charges are in fact uh, continue. Um, so I, it's hard to know just how much they know about her story or how much they will really dig into her story. There's just so much that, that we don't know yet uh, on that. Uh, they're pretty tight lipped. And, and a lot of it was because they still had things to figure out. The, the video really was helpful and the phone was really helpful, but there's a lot of pieces they're putting together to make sure that they can put the murder charges uh, where they need to be. And if they need to uh, make uh, decide on charges for Jen Soto. So it, it's a little bit slow going right now. Where Remember, Kissimmee Police Department is a smaller department than uh, some. Uh, it's a smaller town, and they've got as many people as they can working lot, on it. And but a lot of it eyes. It will take them um, some time. Um, tomorrow will be the first time. Big a day. Lot of eyes. Right. Right. And, and, big, and big day. Tomorrow will be the first time that that we get a get a look. I'm. I'm not expecting a lot from that uh, news conference, though. Vinny. We shall see. Two o'clock tomorrow. Shannon Butler, Erica Morris, Jason Jensen. Thank you all so, so much.